For around seven decades, the Soviet Union had an unrivaled superpower status in terms of mechanical engineering. They put a lot of effort into showcasing their power worldwide through innovative designs. However, the vehicles that came out of this venture left most people in awe, but for all the wrong reasons. The Soviets embraced the most imaginative inventions, from fortified aircrafts to screw-driven trucks and even UFOs. No ideas were deemed too wild or ambitious for them to conceptualize. Get ready for the ride of a lifetime, we are about to explore some of the most extraordinary Soviet vehicles that you didn't think existed. The 2B1 Oka In the Soviet Union, the idea of bigger is always better was made pretty clear from the creation of the 2B1 Oka. This very, ah, uh, well-endowed experimental artillery model was designed back in 1957, just as the Cold War was beginning to heat up. America had recently rolled out their atomic anti-mortar, which fired huge 280mm atomic shells, making it a wagon that could shoot relatively small nuclear bombs. In retaliation, the Soviet military developed two self-propelled nuclear artillery systems of their own, and as you probably guessed, one of them was the utterly insane 2B1 Oka. The barrel of this cannon was a horrifying 65 feet long for contrast, an entire Sherman tank is just 20 feet long. At this staggering size, the barrel could fire 420 mm rounds that weighed a colossal one, 650 pounds apiece, and could land an atomic explosion 28 miles away. Unfortunately for the Oka, its huge gun was also a huge problem with rounds that weighed more than a grand piano. The cannon's laborious loading process meant the Oka could only fire once every five minutes. On top of that, the recoil of the colossal cannon was too much for the rest of the vehicle to endure. The steely chassis was damaged with every shot and would even rip the gearbox from its mounting. Thankfully, this insane design was abandoned in the 1960s when big guns made way for big missiles, but even though it was never used in combat, I bet just rolling it out was enough to give Soviet enemies a real good scare. The 1K17 Shaddy If sci-fi movies are anything to go by, the battlefield of the future will have lasers flying in every direction, and while modern militaries are developing laser technology, there's one Soviet vehicle that's already built for a futuristic laser fight. This is the 1K17 Shaddy, also known as the Soviet laser tank. It was developed back in the 1970s, although it wasn't built to burn holes through the enemy. The array of 13 lasers on top of the tank chassis focused a powerful light source through synthetically grown rubies, with each one weighing a staggering 66 pounds. When the array was fired in pulse, the Shady could destroy the optical sensors on enemy vehicles and missiles, and even cause immediate blindness when fired at enemy tropes. Now that's what I call ultimate laser tag, but this otherworldly weapon never entered service for a number of very good reasons. Firstly, rubies that are heavier than a large microwave oven are not cheap to produce, and secondly, it would have violated the Geneva Convention's protocol on blinding laser weapons if it was ever used in an anti-infantry role. Like war wasn't bad enough, using this would have landed them with a lot of powerful enemy. So it's a good thing that when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, any plans of mass laser tank production fell with it. Okay, I want to do a quick poll. If you had the choice between a 65-foot gun of the Oka or the lasers of the Geneva Convention breaking Shaddy, which would you rather fire for? The enormous Oka hit that lock button and for the blinding Shaddy set your sides on that subscribe button. Can't choose then hit both. The Zvena Project In the 1930s, a little over a decade since the end of the First World War, Soviet Russia realized that the skies would be the battlegrounds of the future. So, it began developing experimental aircraft just in case his Second World War started. Spoiler alerts, it did. Now, Russia was ready to take to the air, but one of the vehicles they created looked more like a flying circus than a military machine. The Zvena project, also called the Chain Link Project, involved a bomber that had been specially modified not to carry bombs, but smaller fighter planes. It was an out-of-the-box plan to save fuel on the front lines as bombers were much more fuel efficient than the smaller fighters. After takeoff, the fighters docked with the carrier while in flight by using some special fastenings, and once they were all strapped down, the bomber flew them off into the fight and refueled them on the way. 
Each of these amazing motherships could carry up to five fighters, and each fighter was loaded up with around 1,000 pounds of bombs. So, if you saw one of these things on the horizon, you knew you were in for a whole swarm of trouble, even though these creative craft were used successfully at the beginning of World War I, the Zveno project wasn't developed any further. During the wartime technology boom, these aircraft quickly became obsolete and were replaced by state-of-the-art fighter jets. Well, the design didn't fly with the military, but I wonder if the project found a home in the Soviet circus scene. The Antonov A-40 The Soviets may have given up on that fortified flying circus, but they were far from done with crazy aircraft designs, don't believe me. Then just feast your eyes on the unbelievable Antonov A-40. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's a tank with wings. This astonishing Soviet prototype was built almost 80 years ago to determine if gliding a tank straight onto a battlefield was possible. At the time, the Soviets were testing whether bombers could be used to drop tanks into position mid-battle. Some of these tests even plunged the tanks into bodies of water to see what damage they sustained on impact. But in 1942, Soviet glider designer Oleg Antonov took the idea one step further. He created a detachable cradle made up of biplane wings and a twin tail that could be attached onto the chassis of a light tank. The A-40 would then be towed behind a bomber and released gliding into enemy territory where it could shed its wings and fight as a standard tank. However, during the 40s maiden flight, the bomber towing, it was forced to drop it early because of the incredible amount of drag the tank generated. It was more like an anchor than an aircraft. Even though the tank and its driver managed to survive the fall, the project didn't. It was ironically dropped in favor of a more conventional weapon system, much to the relief of that poor tank driver, I'm sure. The Mil Mi-10 Now, when the Soviet military wanted some seriously heavy lifting done, they called in a Mil Mi-10 helicopters, despite looking like the love child of a helicopter and a spider. The long legs on this chopper weren't for climbing up buildings or weaving webs between the clouds. It was designed in the late 1950s to carry big bulky loads that the Union's largest helicopters at the time, the Mil Mi-6, couldn't fit in it told. While the Mil Mi-6 could carry a little over 13 tons, the Mi-10's lighter design at external platform allowed it to load up to 15 tons of oddly shaped equipment with those long gangly legs, making it almost 30 feet high. The chopper could taxi over its loads, attach them to its fuselage and fly off with everything in tow. This ranged from trucks and buses to fully built buildings. It was such a strange and shocking sight to behold that the Mi-10 was featured in demonstrations and air shows all over the world to show off its unique. Even though mass production of this wacky flying crane design didn't take off 55 miles, tens were produced during the 1960s and some were still in use up to 2013. I guess a good set of legs never really goes out of the style. The K-84 Yekaterinburg from the 1950s through to 1997, the Soviet Union and later Russia built a total of 245 nuclear-powered submarines. This was more than all other nations combined, but the Soviet submarine obsession almost caused one of the worst nuclear disasters in history. In 2011, the nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine, K-84, also known as Ekaterinburg, made a quick stop in a dry dock, built in 1982, the almost 550-foot-long sub was powered by two nuclear reactors and could carry up to 16 nuclear missiles. But during some routine welding work, a fatal fire broke out along the wooden scaffolding surrounding its bowl. This quickly spread to the submarine itself, and for a whole heart-stopping day, firefighters struggled to control the blaze. The sub had been carrying just four nuclear missiles at the time, but if it had exploded, it would have caused a nuclear accident comparable to the infamous Xi Noble meltdown. As catastrophic as it could have been, the K-84 was gradually repaired, exposing the sheer size of the sub-sonar array. It may be a nuclear death trap, but does anyone else think it looks like that cool ship from the Disney film Atlantis, that it looks like something out of a sci-fi adventure, that big bulb is actually the sonar array's acoustic chamber? This is used to analyze sound waves from sonar equipment and translate it into visual data so that the sub can navigate underwater. 
As cool as it looks, this chamber was filled with a highly flammable liquid that almost ignited during the incident. I don't know what's crazier the fact that these subs are practically bombs made out of bombs, or that the Soviets once had 245 of them. The M15 Belfagor Often referred to as the ugliest plane in the world, the M15 Belfagor certainly isn't the prettiest aircraft to look at. Hailing from the Soviet satellite state of Poland, this government-designed crop duster was meant to replace the old reliable onto Beplane, but the M15 was not what anyone in their right mind would call an improvement. Like the On-2, the Belfigur was also a Beplane, but its design traded a propeller-based turboprop engine for a turbofan-based jet engine. These powerful engines are intended for aircraft that need to reach high speeds. So, using one in an agricultural aircraft was a weird world first. Despite this, it was able to carry up to three tons of pesticides in the huge pylons separating its wings so, the Soviet bloc had huge expectations for the plane, but in reality, the design was a disaster. For a start, it had a maximum range of just 215 nautical miles, half that of the On-2. The jet engine was also more difficult to fix than a turboprop, and it cost much more to build and operate, and to top it off, the funky fuselage design limited the Belfigur's usefulness to crop dusting. In other words, this plane was a strange high-maintenance and expensive one-trick pony. While the Union had plans to make thousands of them, production of this Polish plane was pigeonholed in 1981, thank God. The Lund-class Akrana plan. One of the most unusual vehicles from the time of the Cold War, or any era for that matter, has to be the old Lund-class Ekranoplan at a gargantuan 242 feet long with a wingspan of 144 feet. This bizarre beast could only just fit inside the lines of a standard American football field. You may think with all those wings and jet engines that it's some sort of Soviet air, but this amazing machine is actually a boat-plane hybrid instead of taking to the skies or chopping across the seas. The plan exploits something called the wing-in-ground effect. As it flies closer to the ground, air pressure builds between its specially shaped wings and the service blow. This creates a cushion of air beneath the plane, allowing the entire vehicle to float just inches over the surface of a lake or ocean, and by mounting eight turbojet engines to the front, this behemoth could travel at a terrifying top speed of 340 miles per hour. Not only that, but its sheer size meant it could carry upwards of 110 tons, so it had the capacity of a ship with all the speed of an aircraft. On top of that, can you see those six twin cylinders lining its top? Those aren't party poppers, they're missile launchers with all that speed and firepower. These monsters were designed to take out any incoming US aircraft carriers intruding in Union water. One prototype entered military service in 1987, but when the Soviet regime crumbled, four years later, this low-flying hybrid was left to gather dust. Although if Russia ever needed to fight against a big old sea monster, I think I know which machine they'd bring out of retirement.